I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I hope that meditation was interesting for you. It's the whole process of coming to rest and, and finding a stillness, even though activity may well be going on, thoughts keep coming, sounds keep occurring. Uh, and yet they're, they are in contrast to, as you can to acquire it, a sense of stillness or a find it really a stillness, a restedness. Really good. Uh, let's see, a detail is that uh, we're doing some uh, remediation of mold in our home, Obajoy, and that means that in my uh, office here, I need to keep a door closed but a window open. You may hear our neighbors and their dogs from time to time, as well as the birds. Uh, that's just a something we can let be. Uh, I'd like to respond to uh, two questions that came in um, uh, earlier, and I'll do that fairly briefly and then get into my general presentation about coming to rest in both ordinary and extraordinary ways. Hello, Dougies. So first off, the question is, could you help me with a basic of meditation? I'm not going to use the person's name because they direct message it me. I'm not really clear about why and what I'm learning from being aware or quote unquote mindful. I'm very committed to the practice and yet I lose sight of what I'm learning from being aware. Thank you. Great question. So fundamental. Uh, different layers to this. Uh, so first off, sometimes it's painful to become aware right? You, you might become more aware of your own body and the aches and pains in it, or the sense of its frailties, its aging. Or uh, as you become more aware of what's going on around you, you might realize that people you care about are hurting. And maybe you realize that they're hurting partly because of you, as I've had to come to terms with from time to time. Uh, you know, so the there can be, um, we can feel flooded in our awareness. Willoughby Britton and other um, excellent researchers have explored uh, the ways in which mindfulness can sometimes uh, open people up to things that they're not really ready to manage. So it's important to, to balance the process of expanding an awareness with resourcing yourself so you can tolerate and, and stay present with what you are becoming aware of. That said, uh, Awareness of the inner and outer world gives us tremendous information. Uh, being aware while driving rather than having your eyes you know, closed. Uh, turning on the headlights so you can be more aware of what's a little further down the road. Uh, widening your, your gaze. You know, uh, All these things are full of practical value. Applying and, and all that can be applied to yourself too. So as you become aware of yourself, you become aware of the layerings in your own psyche, deeper layers and awareness of them, it promotes integration and regulation, and those are helpful things. Uh, also awareness of the kind of breadth of your psyche, not just the depth of it, but your body sensations, the quicksilver movement of thought, images, thoughts, feelings, and how they come together. You start to become more knowledgeable about yourself, how, how the... How the, how the flows happen, how the, how the factors swirl together. And that then puts you in a position to exercise skill. And among other things, exercise what the Buddha taught is wise effort, where we, on the one hand, um, reduce, um, prevent, or entirely abandon that which is harmful or painful for ourselves and others, while at the same time creating and increasing and protecting uh, that which is beneficial and enjoyable to ourselves and others. Helps to know that. And along the way, this kind of awareness in the Buddhist tradition, one of the Buddha's fundamental insights, can deepen uh, direct awareness, knowledge of the nature of all thoughts and things as made of parts that are connected and changing. Ah, processes. 
swirling together, including our body and the world and our thoughts and even our sense of I. Not that the body and, and you know the person altogether don't exist, of course they do, but they exist in this more process oriented way, processual kind of way. And that releases and relaxes clinging and, and craving, which then opens up more space for less suffering and more happiness. That's really helpful. Then finishing, um, what starts to happen as well is that as awareness of the contents of consciousness increase, and also, so therefore you get lighter about them, less controlled and hijacked by them. And also as awareness of the nature of all experiences and the nature of all material phenomena as well deepens, increasingly we're able to be with it while not being troubled by it. Our hearts may be full of sorrow at the suffering of the world, but in a certain kind of sense, we're not bothered by that sorrow. We're allowing it. We're responding to it. But it doesn't overwhelm us. And as that occurs, increasingly, in the path of awareness, you become more and more rested in awareness itself. You become more and more rested in the ongoingness of being, rather than any particular form that being takes. And all that may sound a little woo-woo or out there, uh, it becomes fairly natural over time. You just more and more kind of have a sense, at least in the background, of kind of abiding as presence. Maybe that has for you a spiritual dimension to it, capital P presence, rather than simply lower K P presence. So you're increasingly rested as the field in which things are occurring, rather than identifying with and struggling with the things themselves, the experiences and the events in your life. Hopefully that was useful. And uh, practice in general and meditative practice in particular are a preeminent training uh, in the kind of uh, progressive process of deepening awareness that I just named there. All right. I also want to respond to a question, a comment that came in more uh, uh, in the public chat. You could see it at 46 minutes past the hour if you've come in before then. Otherwise, you may not see it. I don't know. From Ed, uh, who writes, Hello, I'm just retired and beginning to do some things I learned decades ago, like meditation, where I always fall asleep. What to do? Stand up and meditate walking? Great question. Um, very common question. At first point, often what we discover when we start coming to rest is how completely tired we already are and fatigued. And there may well be a backlog of what scientists call allostatic load, the gradual accumulation of stress, wear and tear on body and mind. And it could be a while before uh, you, you may need more sleep. <laughs> you know, uh, It may be okay to meditate and just let your mind go to rest and fall asleep. It's okay. Or uh, meditate drowsily. It's, it's okay, right? Uh, and if you want to do some things that can help you to maintain greater alertness uh, on a foundation of making sure you get a good deal of rest and you kind of catch up maybe on years, perhaps, in my case, <laughs> of sleep deprivation. Uh, then on the basis of that, there's some different recommendations. One is to uh, meditate while walking, just like you say. Another is to focus on more stimulating objects of attention, like the feeling of gratitude or love, which is usually more stimulating than simply the recurring sensations of breathing. Uh, you could be aware of breathing throughout your whole body. That's more stimulating than breathing in, say, just the upper lip. You could do things like um, more structured practices in which you're doing uh, things like counting the breaths or repeating a phrase or working your way through the loving kindness phrases uh, in Southeastern uh, Buddhism, such as uh, may I or may another being be safe. Uh, may I be healthy? May I be happy? May I live with ease? Just moving through those, that'll keep you attentive. And then last, um, uh, you know, 
visualizing light or awareness of light, a brightening of the mind, you know, just, that can help you stay more awake as well. Shorter periods of meditation can be helpful too. Can be helpful too. All right. I hope that was useful. Now, I'd like to uh, shift gears into sort of the main thing that I'd like to talk about tonight, coming to rest in ordinary and extraordinary ways. Um, <clears throat> to enter into this, I would like to um, just nod in the direction of the common finding that most of us in the developed countries of the world, maybe elsewhere as well, uh, are chronically sleep deprived. And we don't come to rest enough. Uh, we're racing about much of the day, bombarded with stimuli, and then we get addicted to that, and we don't really come to rest very much. Uh, I remember the finding that in many hunter-gatherer bands, which are our best guess in the bands today, of what life was like for most of the time that our human species has walked this earth for 300,000 years total, only 10,000 of which were in larger population um, organizations. Uh, you know, during mo in hunter-gatherer bands, it takes about four hours a day to meet their needs. The rest of the time, they're kind of hanging out, conserving energy, uh, conserving calories, staying out of the sun, um, hanging out, talking with each other, napping, uh, sleeping, uh, chilling. That's the biological blueprint, uh, and our ordinary lives are in contrast to it. So as a backdrop, a lot of us uh, aren't resting enough, and we don't come to complete rest enough during the day, even if only for a few breaths here and there, or a few minutes here and there each hour. So that's kind of contextual here. Now, one of my favorite and one of the better known um, suttas from early Buddhism that involved a, ser a serial killer named Angulimala. And apparently Angulimala's name came from having a mala, a necklace, this could be a trigger warning for some, uh, a necklace made of the fingers that were amputated uh, from his victims. And Angulimala was a misguided person. Uh, for me, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I figured there probably was a character named Angulimala and who somehow believed uh, or was told by a teacher that the road to enlightenment was somehow through killing a lot of people. In any case, as the story or historical account goes, Angulimala took it upon himself to kill the Buddha uh, after he had had his awakening. And uh, the description is that Angulimala is chasing the Buddha, trying to catch up to him in order to murder him. And yet the Buddha, with his supernormal powers, seemed to be walking serenely, yet always stayed a fair distance ahead of Angulimala, who's running full speed to catch him. Whatever's true about that, Angulimala is reported to have said to the Buddha, stop! Stop! Why don't you stop? And the Buddha turned to Angulimala and said, Angulimala, I stopped a long time ago. Why don't you? Wow. Drop the mic, right? <laughs> A lot of the suttas that have like a high drama in them. This is one of them. And at that, you know, then, however, the details occurred, Angulimala was was struck and was, was felt it and, and realized that difference between the endless quest, the seeking, the chasing, based on something missing, something wrong, compared to a being who had really come to rest, full rest, full stop, and was still participating in the world. But in terms of that uh, craving, clenching, questing part of the mind, whew, in the Buddha, it had come to an extraordinary rest.
Now, an interesting thing happened, which is that later on, as Angulimala practiced the Buddha's way and actually developed a lot of realization, by all accounts, in that um, practice, became quite deeply realized. So there's there's hope for all of us. Uh, Angulimala would still wander um, on alms round, looking for food, carrying his bowl, and so forth, through various villages. And they they knew about his history, and they would mistreat him. They would throw rocks at him, dog poop, um, stone sticks, curses. And he came back to the Buddha and said, Noble Sir, um, I've practiced in your way. I've taken up robes. I'm a renunciate. I'm nonviolent. Um, you know, I've been sincere in my practice, and these people are still throwing rocks at me. What gives? And the Buddha replied, and I'm summarizing a lot of stuff here. The Buddha essentially replied, Well, yes, it is true, Angali Mala, that for some time now, you have no longer generated the causes and conditions of your own suffering. You have no, you have stopped mistreating other people. You have not, you have stopped creating. You have stopped. You have come to rest in creating new karmas for yourself in this life alone. And yet, those forces, those events, those results that you set in motion in the past, based on past behavior, they are still rippling forward through your life. And you must bear them. You must bear them. And here, what we have is a combination of what can be in our lives an inner stillness that is still buffeted by the understandable ripples and results of our previous actions or previous events, people, relationships, jobs, locations, situations in our lives today. And that's a very helpful thing to appreciate. You know, uh, just to bring it down to earth, inside your mind, let's say, you really have come to rest in a kind of a home base. That's our resting place, our home base. You've come to rest in your relationship with someone who's important to you, and yet they still feel wronged by you because you did wrong them, maybe. And you've come to rest where you're no longer in the war, the conflict with them. You're out of the quarrel, and yet they're still they're still motivated to quarrel with you. Um, they, they're still affected by events in the past. And sometimes that's just the truth of things. Both are true. In your heart, you, you do not wish them ill, and yet they still have some processing to do <laughs> with you, and you have some repairing still to do with them. That's just something that happens, and it's helpful to realize that both can be true. In your heart can be a, a stillness, a stability. That which is stable is still. There can be a stability of heartfulness and lovingness and, and basic decency. You can have found your way to a loving and virtuous, blameless stance with them. And meanwhile, they're still, they still have some blaming to do <laughs> based, on, based on at least some bit of your own history. And those things are just true side by side. So that's kind of big picture stuff um, and context, kind of introducing some of the topics here. So my question for you as you reflect here for yourself is, what is the place of rest in your life? Do you, do you make room for rest? I've had chronic failures in that regard. And um, some of them are catching up to me. Uh, 50 years, 60 maybe, of really hitting the gas pedal. Uh, fear not, I'm, I'm, my health is really amazingly good. Um, but I just mean in general, you can feel the gradual accumulation of drive. Even if you've had positive emotions along the way, this is an important distinction. Um, well, honestly, in my own case, I've had people who've known me in my work life 
often and you know on and off over the past many years who would say, wow, Rick, I don't know how you handle the stress. And my reply, I'm often puzzled because I don't feel stressed because I'm really happy and enthusiastic, uh, much of the time at least. And yet, man, am I clocking the hours. And then I began to realize some, some time ago that <clears throat> we may not be accumulating stress load because there's no negative emotion or minimal negative affect at the time, okay? We're not accumulating stress load, but we are accumulating demand load. We're putting a demand on the body-mind that is not meant to work 12 hours a day, day after day after day after day. Sure, our hunter-gatherer ancestors, the biological template, they could do that occasionally. They could sustain bursts of effort occasionally, but it's not the template to do that in our modern you know, 40, 50, 60 hour a week uh, lives. And you know, it adds up over time, even if you really enjoy your work and um, you find a lot of meaning and, and, and satisfaction in it. So think about the accumulation stress load, whose hallmark is negative emotion, distinct from in the work of many people today, distinct from the demand load, from just clocking more hours a day, even if you're enjoying yourself, just clocking more hours a day on task, focused effort, uh, day after day after day after day. And being very aware of the ways that the world and, you know, the corporate overlords and Sometimes your friends really like the fact that you work all that much. You know, think about systems in the culture, such as those that bear on uh, mothers, that just expect long, long hours each day that are not Mother Nature's plan, uh, including the aspects of not being supported by the so-called village it takes to raise a child that's actually, in fact, very often a ghost town in the lives of many parents today. So that's a question. Reflect on that. The past is past. And today, tomorrow, what place can you make for rest in your life? Both the time you set aside for sleep and the ways in which you help yourself come to rest at least once an hour or multiple times an hour multiple times a day, <clears throat> okay? Second, when we come to rest, if what we're doing while resting is ruminating, worrying, resenting, exasperating, uh, hurting, that's not really restful. And if you know my material about the red zone and the green zone, uh, very briefly, this will be familiar to you. Um, in a broad sense, we're continually satisfying various needs. We're, uh, all life is needs fulfilling. It must fulfill its needs, including simply for the next breath, uh, to be able to keep on going. The only question really is, how do, are we fulfilling our needs? Are we doing it on the basis of a kind of restfulness and enoughness a connectedness? Or are we doing it on the basis of feeling unsafe, dissatisfied, and disconnected? Are we feeling, you know, that we're managing our needs uh, on the basis of fear and anger, frustration and disappointment, and or and drivenness, and resentfulness, and, and feelings of inadequacy and loneliness? The first place is the green zone already safe enough, all basically all right right now, with an ongoingness of enoughness, gratitude, contentment that's genuine in the core of your being, with a feeling of connection and love. That's the green zone. The zebra version of that is why, as Robert Sapolsky titled his landmark book on stress, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. This is the biological template. And so, as you can, Ask yourself, huh, how much of my time each day do I spend at home in the resting state of the equilibrium of the body-mind process, 
feeling relatively safe enough, satisfied enough, and connected enough in the present, authentically so. Versus how much of your time do you spend, uh, you know, with a, a fairly invasive sense of anxiety or anger, anxiety or anger? How much time do you spend with an invasive sense of frustration, disappointment, or drivenness, mustness? How much of your time do you spend uh, resenting or feeling inadequate or feeling lonely? We have to be real, right? I'm not talking about faking anything here. You can't fake the green zone. It has to be authentic. But are, thing, are there things you could do outside yourself, in your circumstances, your relationships, your settings, your schedule? Are there things you can do? to help yourself be less jostled out of the green zone. And especially, are there things you can do inside your own mind, in your training, in your practice, in your awareness practices? Are there things you can do to help yourself spend more seconds, spend more breaths, spend more minutes and hours each day, basically in your home base of the green zone, even while you're getting things done? That's a fundamental practice. And in the Buddhist context, as we deepen our restedness in the green zone, our home base, uh, the engine of craving gradually runs out of fuel. There's no basis for craving when you feel already there's enough, already undisturbed. Okay, that's really important to reflect on. Marinate in the green zone. Maybe you just take a moment or two before you get out of bed in the morning and kind of reset yourself uh, with an underlying feeling of peacefulness, contentment, and love. And maybe just before sleep, you also reset yourself by taking a minute or more to rest in a finding a basic sense of peacefulness and contentment and love in whatever words you know are meaningful for you. That's the second thing. The third thing I suggest is to locate that which is at rest already inside you. Ah. Awareness as a field in which experiences are occurring or we is at rest because it is stably the case. The dimension of the aspect of awareness and our ongoing experiencing is stably the case. And as you start to toggle back and forth between the sense of awareness and that which is being aware of, you know, you toggle back and forth between as I do it here, the feeling of the hand moving and the awareness of the hand moving, right? The sensations of breathing and the awareness of those sensations. As you toggle back and forth, you get more and more of a sense of, oh, awareness. There's a stability, a steadiness, and um, an ongoingness and awareness that's at rest. You might also have a sense, and this can get a little airy-fairy, but you can be aware of it. You can also have a sense of what's at rest deep down inside yourself as a kind of stillness underneath it all. It's kind of hard to talk about because the talking is moving. <laughs> There's a stillness underneath it all. The basis of that stillness in my own mind is a mystery to me. And I'm, I'm comfortable with it being at bottom a mystery. Do you appreciate that stillness in yourself? Um, you know, can you uh, like have moments 
of recognizing it. Can you be in contact with that stillness in some ways? Uh, Giving yourself over to it. Because when you're seeking it, then you're not still because the seeking is busy. Uh, So it's a kind of giving yourself over to the stillness that's deep in your nature, deep inside us all. If you relate to this, it's great. And if this is sort of like, well, that's also okay. Because then over time, you'll find your way there more. Uh, Okay, so recognizing, finding, this is my third suggestion, uh, that which in you is already still. And then my fourth on my way to the fifth uh, suggestion is to beware the habits of busyness and the ways in which the culture around us can value busyness as like a badge of honor. Oh, wow, you must be important. You're so busy. Or, wow, uh, you know, we, we keep busy so people looking, you know, they don't think we're slacking off. Busy. And there's this wonderful, uh, I think, uh, it's, I think it's from the Dhammapada to kind of pull it up. It kind of goes like this. I'm going to mangle it a bit. Something like, happily we live at peace among busy people. Free of busyness we dwell among those who are busy. And I have a little photo I put on my wall in my office at home that's from Tricycle Magazine uh, in which someone dressed in Zen robes who's an adult, black robes, is sitting next to a young child also dressed in black robes looking out onto a Japanese garden in covered in snow, one of these rock gardens covered in snow, and uh, just serenely looking out there. So being careful about the addictions of busyness, the dopamine rewards, the chasing of it, uh, the social... Uh, pressures to be busy, uh, the ways in which we, you know, t- become trained to t- to seek narcissistic supplies by being so busy and and busy. Uh, the ways we fear that if we stop running, uh, we'll draw, you know, things will fall apart. So be careful about all that, and be careful about the culture and other people that manipulate us by trying to keep us busy. Or, and including the people who keep us busy because they're not pulling their weight. Oh. At work or at home, you know, we're forced to get busy because they aren't appropriately busy enough. So being aware of that too. And then last, extraordinary, extraordinary restedness. Let's talk, as I said, I will be talking about coming to rest in ordinary and extraordinary ways. Two things here. First, you may know that in the kind of classic path of practice um, laid out in early Buddhism at great length and detail in the canon of teachings, uh, uh, whose written record is in Pali, P-A-L-I, the Pali canon, classic path on the basis of um, development in virtue um, and wisdom involves growing concentration in meditative practice that moves through uh, the jhanas in the right concentration or wise concentration uh, element of the Eightfold Path, and then moves through four additional non-ordinary states of consciousness that I have not experienced, and yet I know a number of teachers who have, quite matter-of-factly, experienced them, and then moves through those, the four form jhanas, in right concentration, and then the four formless jhanas, so-called, or uh, or the formless realms, to the point of cessation, nirodha in Pali, which is the third noble truth. There is cessation, the cessation of the ordinary machinery of conditioned experiences conditioned stream of unconsciousness unfolding, cessation. And in that cessation is 
words fail and encounter, immersion in, abiding as, nibbana, nirvana. That's the progressive process that's been marked by, I imagine at this point, certainly thousands, if not more than that, of people in the Theravadan tradition um, who've practiced that process through cessation, nirvana, and then after some timeless time, time stops there because there's no more conditioned phenomena. There's no more impermanence there. Even the languaging of there is no more just breaks down. There's a return. And in the process of return, there's deep insight into the constructed, impersonal nature of the all thoughts and things, lightening up identification with it all, insights, release, freedom, and so forth. That's the classic description, which I'm summarizing. So in that is a complete coming to rest. It's an extraordinary coming to rest in cessation. Uh, I have not had those experiences, if we can even call them experiences, and yet I know many teachers who are completely credible uh, who have. And the, the Buddha's own account was he did. And so I want to name it and you know, appreciate it on the path. Uh, another kind of extraordinary coming to rest is related to cessation in the sense that, as we find in many, many traditions, including in Taoism, and it's, it's kind of expression infused by Buddhism and Chan and the basis of Zen, in which two English words are commonly used, um, particularly in the work, for example, in the work of the wonderful, wonderful writer and teacher, David Hinton, his book, China Root, is for me highly recommended. The combination, the intersect, reality is comprised essentially of presence and absence. Something and not thing. And so in the language of Buddhism, there is conditioned that which is present, the stuff, the you know unfolding uh, phenomena, material phenomena of mind and matter, including energy as an aspect of matter and vice versa, the unfoldingness of the ordinary Big Bang universe. That's conditioned. Okay. Conditioned phenomena are continually moving, right? The temporal expansion of the four-dimensional space-time Big Bang, ordinary reality, universe, that expansion, which pulls us continuously into the next, as time expands, we live on that, we're very aware of the expanding dimension of time. We're not aware of the expanding dimensions of space because they're so vast. But time, we're being pulled into the future. All of that, including that expansion of time, we live on the expanding surface of the four-dimensional universe. Um, all that, possibly, and I think the Buddha asserted this is true, and I think it is true, all that is unfolding in timelessness that which is unchanging, that which is still, that which is at rest, ultimate reality. Now this all may seem all cosmic and out there. This is hardcore basic Buddhism. Uh, and over time, people can have a growing sense of that which is unconditioned, always just prior to a, to conditioned phenomena. Uh, one can have a growing intimation of a kind of transcendental stillness, a kind of fundamental, extraordinary, beyond the ordinary unfolding of the natural Big Bang universe, of a, of a kind of mysterious timelessness. And some, you know, would have a sense of that unconditionality as imbued with consciousness of some kind and, and a kind of benevolence, a kind of love. That's the ultimate rest. 
That's the ultimate extraordinary resting place, that which is unconditioned, not yet conditioned. You know, the timelessness in which the river of time flows, carrying us along with it. And if it's meaningful to you, as it clearly was meaningful to the Buddha, he pointed to it. He said, this is the point of practice. Essentially, I believe his, his, his ultimate stopping when he turned to Angulimala and said, I have stopped Angulimala. Why don't you? That inner stopping, while the Buddha's heart kept beating and his lungs kept working and activity kept occurring, is that he had a kind of fundamental ongoing uh, recognition of, and who knows, I won't try to ascribe experiences to him, but some kind of ongoing, I believe, um, connection with that which is utterly stopped. Not because it's inert or dead or anything, it's just still. It's the stillness in which activity occurs. And that is the invitation, the great invitation of our teacher to go all the way and along the way have growing a growing sense of that. So to finish here, um, I invite you in your own life into the most basic, worn out monkey, <laughs> you know, aspects of rest. It's okay, we need it, so important. Hug the monkey, <laughs> you know, feed the mouse and pet the lizard. Oh, let it all come to rest, that, beware the seductions of the busy, busy world in all its various false golds. And be aware of that which is in some deep way already still within you that you can take refuge in and find your kind of a place to stand, to like look out at all the whoosh, that which is rushing around you. <sighs> And if it's meaningful to you, allow an intuition uh, and value it of that which is fundamentally and extraordinarily still. Uh, Suzuki Roshi uh, once said, uh, I'm not so sure if there are enlightened beings. I am sure that there are enlightened moments. And in the spirit of that, we may well have moments, flashes, intimations of unconditionality, intimations of timelessness, stillness. Uh, good. And then as I finish here, and I, I hope it's okay that I won't take questions tonight and just leave you with this. Um, an appendix of sorts to this talk is to be aware, as I'm suddenly painfully aware, of how we jostle other people, how we hurry them up, how we harry them, H-A-R-R-Y, hurry and harry people, giddy up, get along, um, and to give a little thought to that, you know, how rapidly we want to reply. Um, you know, I have friends that if they've texted me and I haven't responded within a few hours, it's like, what? Who? <laughs> Be careful about being that oneself. Uh, you know, like, just thought, of, just some thought about that. Um, Appreciating stillness. Certainly the ordinary kind and the extraordinary kind as well. So let's finish here. And if I may quote um, the title of two great books of wisdom. Ready? First one, good night, moon. <laughs> uh, 
And the other one, good night, good night, construction site. So may you be at rest. May you sleep well. When we think of all the constructing, or as it's often translated, all the fabricating of the mind, the fundamental construction site, good night, good night, construction site. May you be at peace.